Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The conference season is over, but only two of them will live in the memory. The Labour conference was a triumph for Jeremy Corbyn, and the Conservative conference was a disaster for Theresa May, right down to the delivery of the P45. They tried to sack Corbyn 12 months before, but this year he was the absolute boy. One of his bright young men joins us to review his own team, and the oppositions, and look ahead to the new session of Parliament. He's the Shadow Secretary of State for Justice, Richard Bergen, MP. Richard, welcome back. Hi, George. On to the Sputnik. Let's start with the Conservative conference. You're too young to remember, but I was an official of the Labour Party when the kind of things that happened to Theresa May yesterday used to happen to us. Sets falling down, uh, all kinds of mishaps. Uh, as Oscar Wilde put it on the death scene of Little Nell, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to laugh. What did you think? Did you laugh? Well, I, um, I felt uncomfortable, as I'm sure many uh, viewers uh, did, but the real worrying thing for the Conservatives wasn't that Theresa May's speech turned into something like a scene from Peep Show or The Office. Uh, the, real, <laughs> the, the real problem, the real problem... That's bringing it up to date. It is. Charles Dickens to it the is. office. The, the real problem is it was a speech lacking in vision, lacking in hope, repackaging policies of the noun store already and pale imitations of Labour policy as well. But also during this conference, the Conservative mask of decency slipped. Look at uh, the Foreign Secretary's comments, for example, uh, on Libya, saying that in order to make profit in Libya, all you've got to do is clear away uh, the dead bodies. Is. And that wasn't uh, a gaffe gone wrong. That, in my view, was a window into the world view yeah. of the Bullingdon boy that thinks they're born to rule, not just this country, but around the globe. Uh, fair point, uh, but let me stay with the comic uh, uh, aspects uh, first, if I may. Uh, of course, the speech in content terms would be subject to uh, criticism by people like you and by people like me. It was a speech that had to be great and was disastrously bad. It was a conference that had to be smooth, smack of firm government, we're in charge, we're going on. And none of it looked like that, did it? And the Prime Minister will know that that could be uh, the last uh, speech he makes as Prime Minister to the Conservative Party conference, uh, and to say it didn't go well uh, is, a, is no exaggeration. Yeah. The main problem they have, though, isn't it, that nobody that's sitting alongside her or behind her looks any better a bet. Uh, Boris Johnson, to me, is the only alternative leader they've got, and he's accumulating skeletons in his closet all the time, and the one you cite is just the latest of them. Isn't that their problem? They'll cling to nurse for fear of something worse. That's right, and what people have got to understand is that getting rid of Theresa May or if she disappears uh, is not a solution to the problem. The problem is the free market ideology that she espouses with an almost, an almost religious fervour. She says that the free market economy and free market economics is the highest achievement of her humanity. So even if she's replaced by someone else, the austerity will continue, the cuts will continue, the privatisation will continue, and a government for the privileged few, not the many, will continue as well. What about the media? They, uh, they were once persuading us to fall in love with Theresa May, but almost without exception, they've turned against her, haven't they? They have, so the editor of The Sun was spotted taking a morning jog with Boris Johnson at the party conference this week, but now we reach the end of the week, The Sun is having critical front pages of uh, Theresa May. The truth is, no one, even billionaire newspaper owners, want to be 
uh, associated with uh. failures, <laughs> even if it's a failure that they ideologically mm. agree with. Mm. They want conservatism to be preserved, and they probably think that getting rid of Theresa May and replacing her with someone else is the best way to uh, maintain the government they support. We'll come to your conference in a minute, but uh, as we about to reassemble the parliament, uh, isn't the real problem is that the parliamentary arithmetic doesn't change, that the Tories uh, don't have to call a general election, would, from their own standpoint, be insane to do so, and as long as they keep the DUP sweet, uh, and I could tell you a way that that can be done, uh, pave the streets of East Belfast with gold, maybe throw in a few jewels to encrust it, and you'll keep them sweet, the Tories are going to be in till 2022. Well, we shall see. It's our job to make sure that they disappear as soon as, as possible and replaced uh, by Labour government. But look at the way that the Conservatives are treating Parliament. Opposition days occur every week on a Wednesday, uh, as you know. They're now under orders, Conservative MPs, not to bother voting in these votes. So they are making a mockery of Parliament. They're passing as little legislation as possible. They're trying to undermine every aspect of our parliamentary democracy. So actually, I think when you look across Europe and around the world, you see that the people at the top are quite happy to discard important aspects of democracy when it suits them, when they're not getting their own way. Now, your own party conference went quite the opposite. Mm. 11,000 people attended uh, uh, the conference in Brighton. Tell us about it. It was wonderful. It's the best conference uh, that I can uh, remember. I've been going to Labour Party conference uh, for uh, maybe uh, nearly 20 uh, years. There were more people there, more politics than ever before, more participation than ever before, and more positivity than ever before. And the unification uh, of all the different strands of the Labour movement behind Jeremy Corbyn and behind the manifesto that we're now expanding, the manifesto that did so well at the general election, is really, really encouraging. So it's a fantastic conference. It left us with a real sense of hope that we can deliver, we can deliver uh, on what we started to deliver on in the general election and get a Labour government that will change things fundamentally in the interest of the majority. Of course, there was a long period when everybody was united behind Tony Blair and there was uh, a sense that the leader was all-powerful then too and look what happened. Uh, some would say, I've got some sympathy with it, that by avoiding a debate on Brexit, you really missed the opportunity to uh, chisel out and present to people a genuine, firm, hard platform for Brexit. What do you say about that? Well, there was a, a debate uh, on uh, Brexit during the conference and Keir Starmer spoke about that and Jeremy Corbyn in his speech spoke about it as well. But what I would say is, despite the protestations uh, of others, many of whom historically haven't supported Jeremy Corbyn, despite their protestations that Brexit is a number one issue, when I've been door knocking in my constituency and others and I ask people, what's the number one issue for you? Brexit post-referendum is very rarely mentioned either by Remainers uh, or uh, by Leavers. I think as socialists we've got to make clear that the real divide in British politics, the real divide in British society, isn't between the 48% who voted Remain and the 52% who voted Leave. It's actually between the 99% and the super-privileged 1% at the top, because whether or not Britain's in the European Union, there'll still be a housing crisis, still be the scandalous uh, casualisation of labour and low wages, unless we fundamentally change the way the economic system runs and in whose interests it is uh, run. So actually, the f it's the, now the job of Labour, in my view, to unite uh, people who voted Leave and people who voted Remain uh, for uh, the, the project of creating a society that's run in the, the interest of the many, not the few. Well, I mean, that's true, and I expected you to say that, and I've heard you say it uh, before, but I have to press you because the clock is ticking. Uh, it's only 18 months until you'll actually have to get off the fence and say, yes, we're going to support leaving the European Union on those terms, or on no mm. terms at all, or no, we're going to oppose it. You won't be able to avoid this for very much longer. That's true, but Britain is leaving the European Union. Labour accepts and respects the outcome of the referendum. So what we want to concentrate on now is what kind of Britain post-Brexit we have. How does the economy run? Um, how is the economic system running? In, in whose interest is it run and by whom? That's a key question for Labour. Yeah. There's a very 
key question uh, coming up uh, very soon. Spain is literally falling apart. What does Labour have to say about the conduct of the Spanish government uh, in relation to the referendum and about separatism in Spain as an issue? Mm. Well, uh, Jeremy and Emily were very quick to condemn the handling by uh, the Spanish state of the situation in Catalonia. No one can fail to be appalled by the scenes they've seen. And a lot of people are very, very disappointed uh, about the lack of a firm response uh, from the uh, European uh, Union. Very, very disappointed it indeed. Shows their true face, really. I yeah. mean, that's now Greece. Uh, it's uh, the uh, Iberian Peninsula has been bullied and browbeaten. We think we've got austerity. Try Spain. They talk about young people loving the European Union. Try Spain, where 50% of the young people are unemployed. Exactly. Uh, and where they're now in a state with a right-wing government under heavy manners from the European Union. Uh, I, I really think it's time for the British left to open their eyes a bit on the, on the European Union. But only time for one more uh, question, really. Jeremy Corbyn, whom I've known for almost 40 years, sat beside in Parliament for almost 30 years, will never be more powerful than he is right at this minute. He has dispersed his enemies. He has won the hearts of millions of people in Britain. Isn't it time to really fundamentally change the Labour Party and forever? Wasn't that an opportunity missed at the Labour conference? Well, the Labour Party needs to be more democratic. The Labour Party needs to modernise because a party with 600,000 members can't be running the same way that a party with 180,000 members, mm. which is what we had before the 2015 general election, uh, yeah. is run. If we're going to be truly a party for the many, not the few, the members have to have as much of a voice as possible. So I welcome the changes on the National Executive Committee, meaning that constituency Labour parties and trade unions get more representation. And also uh, welcome uh, the reduction in the threshold to 10% of the number of MPs required yeah. in a future leadership uh, election. But what I would say is that I hope that the the review that's going to take place is a review that as many members as possible take part in and consider all options to make our party more participatory. People demand greater participation in politics and everything else in the modern age, and that's quite right that they do. That they do. So, for example, something that could be considered uh, is allowing all the constituent elements of the Labour movement, MPs, uh, constituents of Labour parties, and trade unions and affiliated social societies, each of them to be able to... Uh, have a say in who goes on uh, the ballot paper in future yeah. leadership elections. Because each of those three groups, actually, even the MPs, bring something very valuable to the table in terms of their own experience. Richard, you're a likely lad. Thanks for coming again Thanks very on much. board the Sputnik. Coming up next, what's going down in the Philippines? Don't miss it. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Ever since the overthrow of Ferdinand Marcos, the U.S. puppet president of the Philippines, the country has craved a credible leader. President Duterte may be controversial, but in tackling the evil drug trade and tacking away from the U.S. towards China and Russia, he is drawing heat from the empire. Will he succeed? Will he survive? The Philippines are our, well, my closest neighbor, and an independent archipelago which works might just be catching in my own archipelago of Indonesia. Joining us to discuss it is Professor Bruce Rivera, a Filipino law professor and commentator. Luckily for us, he's currently visiting London. Professor, thanks for joining us. Not many people in Britain know anything at all about President Duterte, so let's begin by trying to place him on the political spectrum. How would you characterize his politics, or is he a maverick individual who defies uh, definition. Well, well, the, the president, uh, Duterte, is virtually an outsider in Imperial Manila. He is um, usually, when you become a president, you, you start with, uh, you know, with a congressman, become a senator, and then you, you, you become president. He, is, he did not follow that route. In fact, he is uh, considered an outsider in, in the Metro Manila political scene. He is a mayor in Davao City, one of 
the largest cities in, in Mindanao. 22 years of mayor, Yes, 22 it? years of mayor, mayor. He transformed Davao City. I come from Davao City. My family comes from Davao City. After the Marcos regime in 1987, it was the most horrible place to be in. He transformed Davao City to the one of the, the most... Uh, progressive cities in the Philippines, and, and, and that's his track record. He is a real executive mm. who ran a city, a very, you know, a very exciting city, one of the largest cities in the Philippines air, land area-wise. And uh, virtually, he does not even want to be in Manila because he likes, he hates the traffic. He hates, mm. he cannot even speak straight Tagalog. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why he's very misunderstood because, you know, you know if you speak, Visaya or, or Visayan, and you try to speak Tagalog, it's a different thing. And we, you know, different accents, different use of words. And for a long period of time, he was been, you know, he was been castigated for poor use of, of Tagalog words. And what are his political priorities? Insofar as anyone knows him, they know that he's determined, even brutally, to destroy the drug trade. Tell us about that. Well, the president basically made three great campaign promises. And uh, and knowing him, he would, you know, stick on that. The first one is, of course, with regard to federalism. We're starting to lay down the predicate for doing that. Second one is with regard to corruption, because whether we like it or not, even after the Marcos regime, we were, you know, we were swamped still with the same corruption, even made more bureaucratic, more, more institutionalized corruption. And the third one is with regard to, to the war on drugs. And many people in, in the Western world think that the drug problem in the Philippines is, an, is a health issue, but it's not a health issue. It's a different kind of problem. It, it targets uh, the poorer individuals. It, it latches onto... Well, it's, it's evil because it's not, a, it's not a health issue, but it is more an epidemic. It's poisoning the poor people it's causing people to commit, go to crimes. And it's, not, and it's not about addiction per se. It's about poverty. And they're taking, making you, uh, taking advantage of that. And you mentioned federalism. Tell us what he has in mind on that. Because as you implied in your earlier remarks, politics in the Philippines has been mainly, ma mainly Manila. Yes. Uh, is the uh, opportunity now being uh, taken to properly and truly devolve power to the many disparate parts that make up the Philippines. That is, that, that is precisely the reason why he, he is espousing federalism. Of course, because, of, uh, because many of his core supporters are still in the process of trying to really get their gra grasp on what kind of federalism or what kind of system they would want to, we are in the process of trying to see which federalism works because many have been many have been espousing the French kind, the the well, the American kind, even the Malaysian kind. But at the end of the day, we have to let the people understand what we, we what we are going into before we actually like move forward. That's why he is still into the process of actually going into the first two campaign promises he had, which is of course destroy destroy the drug trade, and secondly, with regard to corruption. So he's in a firefight with the the drug traders, isn't he? He's in a firefight with the organized crime that has grown exceedingly rich he, on he, feasting on the carcass of the poor whom they get hooked on drugs. That is, that, that's the reason why, why the anger, not just of President Duterte, but many of the Filipinos, especially the overseas foreign workers who go to, here in Great Britain, for example, and go to the United States, leave their children behind only to get hooked on drugs. And it's not the, the it's not the drug that is like you know that does not destroy the mind. It's it's meth. Mm. It's very cheap to make, and they can sell it cheaper, and they 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 get money by the numbers. Meaning they you know why have two clientels when you can have twenty million clientels? Um, when the drug war was announced officially, there were there were around at present one point four million Filipinos who voluntarily surrendered because they are hooked on drugs. Hmm. If that is, you know, that is, that number, 1.4 million, that is disturbing enough. And for, for how many years, we were in the dark as to the, the extent of the drug war, uh, of the drug problem. Now, while there are obviously opponents of his, of his war on drugs, he's also made quite some enemies, not just in the West, 
also in your own country. Yes. The Archbishop, you know, the Catholic <laughs> Church, for example. <laughs> Obviously, there's the main, uh, main religion in the country. How does that work? Well, the Catholic Church is very supportive of the past administration, more particularly that of Corazon Aquino. Mm. They were, you know, part and parcel, um, influential in, in, in more ways than one because they helped, you know, depose President Marcos. And they have, you know, they have made a lot of concessions here and there. But at the end of the day, they are a rich group of individuals because they, are, they have been investing and they have been major stockholders in all the, the biggest companies. Most of them are owned by oligarchs who were heavily um, supported by the past administration. So we expected that uh, opposition. We expected that kind of, uh, of, uh, of anger from, from the Catholic Church. But Filipinos now do understand that and do realize that, you know, we have to deal with that and we have to face it head on. Now, tell me about the foreign policy issues, uh, which greatly interest me. For the first time, he's the first president uh, since the overthrow of absolute dictatorship of the Marcos uh, era. He's the first president that's prepared to uh, see the Philippines as having options in foreign policy. Under Marcos, you had the biggest United States military oh. bases in the world. Vietnam was leveled by forces yes. operating out of your country. Now you've got a president who's visiting China, who's visiting Russia, who's talking with other powers in the world, emerging powers in the world, and seeking a kind of independence uh, in Philippine foreign policy. Tell us about that. Well, in the past, we have been, you know, we have been Uncle Sam's baby boy. We have been, we have been, but I call it, we are the whipping boy of Uncle Sam for the longest time. And President Duterte understands that. I think he's pissed about it because, you know, we have been getting the, the, the short end of the stick. Um, the, well, upon the egging of the United States, we, we, we actually filed the, the claim on the Spratleys and the Scarborough Shoal, which caused, you know, a victory on our part. But technically, it was a victory on paper, but, but you know. What did you get out of it? Nothing. Uh, yeah. Nothing. We, we, you know, we fought over a small number of islands on the basis of sovereignty. But at the end of the day, we got into China's bad side. And... In all honesty, China is our neighbor. Mm. It's Asian. Mm. And that's perhaps the reason why our president took a pragmatic approach and took you know, a Philippine approach that uh, we are not separating from the US, but we will always have an independent foreign policy that is not necessarily pro-American, but pro-Filipino. And we respect that. Uh, only a few seconds left, so uh, briefly, is he in it for the long term? Uh, is he going to complete this term? Will he run again? The Constitution prevents him from running again. Mm. So he's trying the, mo the, the, the best out of the six years to fix the drug war. And we have, and honestly, we are losing the international perspec per perspective. But in reality, there is no, you know, there is, there, it's, it's really a wrong a notion that people are being killed in the Philippines because they are not. When they say 10,000 people are killed, technically only 3,900 were killed on drug-related cases mm -hmm. because the definition of extrajudicial killing has been muddled to the point that even those who are killed in homicides and murders are considered sa mm. such. And they're being blamed on the president. Yes, and, and in 2013, under, under the Aquino administration, 16,000 people were killed. There's no uproar about it. No, because uh, Aquino was a, a puppy of the United States. That's yeah, the yeah, difference. Uh, yes, Professor, of course. Uh, we've run out of time. It's Thank been a you. pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I used to travel a lot to the Philippines, and it's in my heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank us. you for giving us a chance. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Right, highlights of this year's Labour Party conference. Peter B. says, the Labour Party was great, but the highlight of the political conference season for Labour was the Tory conference. Exactly. <laughs> uh, John Prescott, the former Deputy Prime Minister, tweeted, Teresa, I really don't want your conference to end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, dear. Right. Is President Duterte right in his war on drugs? Circle of Rage says it's about as effective as war on terror. So, no. 
where, as Roger the Dodger says, first step of building a strong and prosperous nation is self-respect. Reading the Philippines of drugs and prostitution will be a good start. And Ricardo Picasso adds, our own war on drugs is non-existent, whereas Duterte's really is a war. Something between the two is possible to wipe out this evil of the world. I'm not sure uh, what the third way would be on fighting this, and I think it's important, as the professor did, to make it clear to the hippies out there, <laughs> we're not talking about a war on people smoking <laughs> marijuana. We're talking about a, a crystal meth epidemic. Yeah. We're Break, talking about breaking, breaking, bad, breaking bad, bad on a national scale involving millions of people. There's no way to fight that except with the utmost rigor. And that's what the president's doing. Well, that's all the time we've got for the tweets today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media. Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today, or on Twitter and Instagram, RT underscore Sputnik. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>